Hello and welcome to the Career Speakeasy, a casual, fun, and irreverent place to share ideas about career development, the world of work, and life in general. I'm your host and proprietress, Kelly Nottingham. Growing your career should not be boring. So come on in, pull up a chair, and pick your poison. Welcome everyone to the podcast. We have a very special episode today. I'm going to be actually doing an interview with one of my dear friends and a former work colleague, Kristen Chestnut. So Kristen, welcome, welcome, welcome. So much gratitude for you being here today. So if you would, quick intro about yourself, and I know I put you on the spot because you are an introvert and I'm like, hey, introduce yourself really fast. So my apologies, but you're awesome. So you'll be fine. No worries. No worries. <laughs> you think I'd be used to this, right? You always you have to do it anytime you join a new job, meet new people. And I still never know what to say about myself. So okay. um, I'm Kristen Chestnut. Yes. You and I have worked together in the past quite a bit. It was amazing. Um, I have worked in corporate learning and development for 12 years now. And I am currently an instructional designer, but I have done everything under the sun regarding learning and development, LMS management, instructional design, learning strategy, done some DE&I work, um, employee engagement, all that good stuff. I know you and I have worked together a ton and we have gone through a lot of organizational change together. Um, We've gone through a lot of transitions at work and like weirdness at work or big, huge initiatives at work that we've been trying to solve for. Um, And so I feel like because we do approach work, sometimes work with a big capital W in the same way sometimes, but also in different ways sometimes, I thought this would be an interesting conversation to have with you. So I have been thinking a lot lately about finding purpose in my work and finding purpose at work. And um, there's been tons of conversation about this. I've seen tons of articles coming out about this on LinkedIn and in all different types of, of HR magazines, but also just across the board in conversations around engagement, um, the recent whole conversation about quiet quitting, which if you know we can talk about that a little bit if, if you're interested in that. But this idea of trying to find your purpose in your work and how that can maybe be a good thing and maybe not be a good thing. Uh, So I wanted to just start off with asking you if you had any general thoughts about that. What have you been seeing about these ideas about finding your purpose at work? Yeah, it really, like you said, it has been all over the place lately. And I definitely have a lot of thoughts about quiet quitting. Um, Generally, I think finding purpose in work I don't see it as a good thing, but I think it opens up a broader conversation around the difference between purpose in our work or purpose because of our work. And I think there's a huge difference because you and I have talked extensively in the past about how we're the kind of people that we have to enjoy and like the work that we are doing. We can't be that kind of person that just goes to work, does a job, doesn't matter what the work actually is. We both like to be intellectually challenged by what we're doing. However, that has mm-hmm. obviously led to a lot of burnout for both of us mm-hmm. in the past repeatedly. repeatedly. And I think that's because, and I might be getting a little ahead of us in the conversation nope. here, but I think There's that's no such because thing. <laughs> we were also defining our value through our work yes. and not being able to distinguish. And I think that's kind of the thing that people are starting to realize And I think it's important to acknowledge that everybody is different, right? Some people absolutely do want to have purpose through their work and that's totally fine versus people like us who want to have purpose in our work. We'd like to have work that does have value, but we don't want it to define our, our value or our lives. Yes. Yes. And I I love the way that you say that the way that I've been sort of noodling on this topic is work. We have value in mm-hmm. ourselves. Finding that value within ourselves can be, we can find an outlet for it through work, but that it's not necessarily the creation point for that sense of value. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I, this is one of the conversations that my husband and I have on a regular basis. And you know, my husband, he is one of those people that does not find his sense of purpose in the work that he does. 
Mm-hmm. And he, you know, he says, if I'm getting paid and I can do what I want to do in my free time, I don't really care what I do for a living. Like they can, they can pay me to, to work at my desk doing my job, or they can pay me to literally clean the desks at the end of the day at my job. I don't care as long as I'm getting paid and I can afford to do the things that, you know, that I want to do and, and support my family the way we need to be supported. Um, I think that it's, to me, in a sense, it's a very liberating way to go through life. Like I've often told him that I'm kind of jealous of that because it allows him to just relax at work. Like he doesn't get the same weird stress that I do sometimes at work. And I had a thought about this yesterday and this is like total tangent, but I had a thought about this. So I was wondering if somehow this may tie in with our uh like love languages because he values um being a provider in our relationship and like being able to support his family that is where he finds his sense of purpose and i find my my love language is acts of service so i like to help people i want to to try to support people i want to do things for people and it this just dawned on me yesterday I'm like, maybe I wonder if this ties in somehow with sort of just our general outlooks on life and the way that we we kind of tie in our own sense of self with mm-hmm. the way that we approach our work. But yeah, we we do. You and I do. We definitely have that same sense of wanting to to help people. I would be interested to hear you talk a little bit more about this idea of your value, finding your value, finding your worth within your job? Where have you seen that for yourself? And where have you seen the companies that you've worked with try to do that? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) certainly I have seen companies try to do that, but I think where, I think where a lot of companies are missing the mark, I I think it was well-intentioned that you now employee engagement is certainly growing in popularity among companies. There are whole departments dedicated to, dedicated to it now, like I mentioned, I've done employee engagement work in the past, but I think, unfortunately, for a lot of organizations, they've kind of twisted it and they don't understand what engagement means anymore. Okay. Engagement has kind of become this thing of going above and beyond. And I think that's where quiet quitting has come about after the past couple of years. And quiet, quiet quitting, the conversation around that is really interesting right now because I'm seeing the articles on LinkedIn, but I'm also seeing people who are like doing quiet quitting and their conversations around it. And I think that the huge thing that's been revealed is this is yet another place where executives and, you know, higher up in HR and companies are misunderstanding what quiet quitting is. It it is the person who originally coined the term. I don't think they realized it was going to explode the way that they made it did. Um, I think a more accurate term people have tossed around is acting your wage And because it's not about being lazy, it's not about doing the bare minimum or coasting. It's about doing what you were hired to do, doing what you are being paid to do, doing it well and getting it done. But especially over the past few years, certainly has been going on for decades, but COVID kind of helped wake everybody up uh, and reevaluate our values Mm -hmm. and uh, our value Mm -hmm. related to work Mm -hmm. and realize we were putting all of this extra effort into our jobs. We were giving our companies so much more. We were doing tons of stretch assignments, tons of extra work. I know I ended up at one point doing the job of literally eight people because I counted how many people they had let go of over the years and their work was given to me. And we're not given any kind of additional payment for that. No bonuses, no raises, no other kind of financial compensation for the extra work. And at the same time, of course, with what's going on in the economy, we we see cost of living increase. And so we just kind of see this value of like, well, if I'm not going to get anything out of it, why would I keep doing it? Because the original promise you made to me was, well, if I go above and beyond and I do the work to show that I'm worthy of mm-hmm. that extra title or the extra money, you'll give it to me. Mm-hmm. And then they didn't give it to us. Mm-hmm. And so quiet quitting is about embracing that, acting your wage. And understanding that our value can be outside of work. Like, fine, I'm, I'm still going to go to work. I'm still going to absolutely do a great job and get what I am paid to do done. But I'm going to find value outside of work. I'm 
going to travel. I'm going to, in my case, as you mentioned, I read a lot. I've read mm-hmm. a lot more in the past few years than I have. Honestly, I think I read more books last year and this year than I have in maybe the past two decades, like combined. Wow. <laughs> I've, I've read a lot. Um, and it's something that I didn't even realize how much I missed doing, but I was always so exhausted from work because I was attaching my value to it and I didn't know who I was outside of it. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm dedicating more time to those other things, I'm able to start to see that. And I still absolutely enjoy what I do. I enjoy my job. I still love to be intellectually challenged, but I love that I'm able to separate my value as a human being from my career, because to me, that's not what I want. Other people, absolutely. That is what they want. They want to be defined by their job. And again, totally fine, but we have to recognize everybody's different and stop pushing this narrative that there's one right way to view it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and making it shameful to not participate in, in Mm -hmm. work culture that way. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you're bringing up this conversation because I've been doing a lot of reading about quiet quitting myself. And I actually have just done some videos I'm posting on social media about the concept of quiet quitting and how I am concerned for people that see this as disengagement from their job and that disengaging from their job is a solution to being frustrated at work (laughs) because it's not. Um, I know you have tried this. I have tried this, that I, I, it almost feels like the pendulum is is trying to swing really far the other way. Like, okay, I drank like all of the corporate Kool-Aid, all of it, like bathed in the corporate Kool-Aid. And now I'm just going to do the bare minimum. And like you said, some people are interpreting it that way. But I, I know I've been in that situation where I have done that and tried to pull back and try to do the bare minimum instead of finding that outside of work identity for myself. And I ended up in that position of being, I was miserable. I was miserable at those jobs. Um, I felt like I was wasting my life because again, tying in that sense of worth to what I was doing. If I wasn't doing anything, then I was by definition worthless. It made it really difficult to figure out what what exactly was wrong. And I, I think that's the problem for a lot of folks right now who are trying to understand this idea of finding your value outside of the work that you do. Uh, so I, I'm interested to, to hear about how you have done that for yourself. You mentioned traveling, you mentioned reading, Um, What was sort of that disentangling like for you to help you understand that your value as a human being is not in your value as a human doing? There's a (laughs) t-shirt. See what you did there. (laughs) Um, It certainly hasn't been a smooth process. And I mean, complete transparency, I'm still figuring it out. It's not something I think, (laughs) yeah, I I don't think that it's something that you can easily break from, especially Mm -hmm. because like, if I really reflect on it, it goes back to my childhood, right? Like I think a lot of us can probably tie a lot of the ways that we are now back to experiences when we were younger to the point like, you know, my parents waking me up because I was sleeping past 7am on a Saturday and they're telling me I'm like wasting the day. Right. So coming to understand growing up that if you're not being productive, you're being lazy Yes. and treating laziness as a bad thing, but it's honestly not. And I mean, there's actually even a book that I will recommend uh, called Laziness Does Not Exist by Devin Price. Okay. Um, and it, it breaks that myth that like laziness isn't a real thing, because if you think about it, we have to rest. Mm-hmm. If we don't rest... Mm-hmm how are we going to continue to be productive? Yeah. And I think that's one of those things a lot of people have woken up to. And again, that's still something that I'm trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. Um, Another book that I will recommend is called burnouts by Dr. Amelia Nagoski and Dr. Emily Nagoski. And they Mm -hmm. kind of address that, that there, there are multiple types of rest that we have to have. And a lot of us don't get them. Um, Okay. So think about like, you have to have mental rest. So this is something that like the 40 hour work week that's in conversation right now. Um, a lot of companies are also testing out four day work weeks because of that, where you're still getting paid your full salary, but you're only actually working four days a week. And it's not 
for 10 hour days, you're working for eight hour days. So we really okay. are just, you know, going down to a 32 hour work week because of the fact that especially intellectual work, our brains were just not meant to think eight straight hours a day, yeah. five days in a row. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not possible. And then you think about the conversation related to that too, with companies wanting to bring people back into the office for company culture. Well, maybe that worked initially because how many times were you and I just chatting? We weren't working. Mm -hmm. Company culture is essentially doing nothing but talking to people in the office. Right. Like, right. It's not relationship actually building. It's, yeah, it's relationship, relationship building. It's bonding. Yeah. It's making your friends at work, which again, for some people, they love right. it. That's what they want. Fantastic. Love it. Do it. Um, but trying to force that on everybody is that is mm -hmm. if that's the one way of work, it's just mm -hmm. not the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so like I said, I, I'm still trying to figure this out. I think for me, it's about figuring out how and where to set boundaries with work. Mm -hmm. So I've never really been the kind of person to have like my email or teams on my phone because I've mostly used personal phone, even having a work phone it's important for me to shut it off when I'm done for the day, because if I'm quote unquote clocked out for the day, that's when I'm going to spend time on me. And that can look like whatever. And then I also have anxiety. So of course, if something really stressful is going on at work, it's incredibly difficult to shut my brain off from yes. that and stop thinking yeah. about it. But it yeah. is something that I am trying to work on Yeah, and tell myself, you know, your working hours are done. You can address it tomorrow. The company is not going to come crashing down because <laughs> there's the no such thing as a training emergency. <laughs> there's no saying. such thing as a training emergency. Like, yes. especially in our line of work and a lot of line of right lines of work, we feel like we, everything is on fire. Mm -hmm. And the reality is like our work can be important, but mm -hmm. is it truly something that's urgent? The Eisenhower decision matrix. Like, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, mm -hmm. And even if it's urgent, is it then also important? It's like, does it need right. to get done? So right. kind of asking those questions and thinking that through in my own mind when I start to, it's certainly, I still have weekends where I'm like stressing out because it was just such a stressful week. So I'm, like I said, I'm not perfect at it um, by any means, but I think setting those boundaries has been huge for me and mm -hmm. reading, I think has helped that because it gives me something to truly look forward to. If I'm in the middle of a really good book and I want to get back to it, then I'm going to have mm -hmm. no problem ending my work day at four o'clock so that I can go over to the couch right behind me <laughs> and open that book up and see what's happening. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely still working on this. And, and in a sense, I feel like I'm still at the beginning of this journey because this is one of those things that we, we sort of cycle back through it if we don't catch it and we don't stay diligent with it. Um, I was raised with a lot of the same kind of concepts. Um, I was also raised in a, I wasn't, I, I, I did not come from a baby boomer age family. Even I came from a previous generation, um, silent generation, I think um, family. So, you know, the, the work ethic was, like paramount, paramount. And laziness was equated to worthlessness um, very explicitly uh, growing up from, you know, the, my community and, you know, the, the Protestant church that I grew up in and Protestants are particularly prone to, to this whole work really, really hard ethic, but it's, it's something that wasn't really even occurring to me as, as that much of a problem? Like I, but it, it's, it's really become a problem because when we associate being productive with our sense of worthiness and our sense of value, we can never do enough, but there's always a gap there. There's always a point where we could do more. And that sense of pushing and striving, I think we see this in different places. We see this in the world of work. I think we we see and did see this in in this whole hustle culture with putting you know creating side gigs and like work a full time job but also create a business on the side and also be working out so that you look like uh, you could be in a Marvel movie tomorrow because you're like super fit and also meal prepping and also you know like you're environmentally aware and doing all this volunteer work on the side 
And this sense of like, we can always do more, always do more, always do more to give ourselves more worth. That's been something that I've really been thinking about in the context of this conversation and trying to, to pull apart those two ideas that the more I do does not equal me having more value. I have been in jobs as well where I had the pager going way back, um, had the pager, had a Blackberry for a long time, have, you know, the work cell phone, the, you know, the apps on my phone that tie me back to work all the time. And it's, it's honestly been one of the, the, the things that I have started actively avoiding at work and really forcibly setting those, those lines in the sand. But we still have this idea that like, well, if my boss emails me at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, are they going to look down on the fact that I didn't respond back? And I think this is, this is going to be major, major cultural shifting going on with this. Uh, I think this, to your point, is one of those interesting things that did come out of COVID that we started looking back and going, why am I working this hard? Why am I doing this much? When I don't need to necessarily achieve to be comfortable in my life. I don't need to overachieve to be able to to do the things that I want to do in life. I met, I was recently in uh, on vacation um, in Austria, in Vienna, Austria, and actually met this young woman working in a coffee shop there. Uh, she is American and she ended up moving to Vienna because of a relationship. The relationship had broken apart. She decided to stay. And she, when we were talking to her, she was working in this beautiful cafe right in the middle of historic Vienna. And we were asking her about what her life was like. Like, this was amazing to me. She's in her early twenties. She's made this drastic, radical life choice. That's just really amazing. And she said that she doesn't even work full time. She said, I could, but I'm comfortable and I enjoy my life and I enjoy being able to take off and go on trips with my friends. And so why would I work harder and take away time from those things? And I remember just sitting there, just sitting back in my seat and going, my God, this, this very young woman in my mind, like if I had had this wisdom at that age, what decisions would I potentially have made? different from what I did. It, it still resonates with me. That conversation still resonates with me being comfortable without having to push so hard. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned the idea that it's so radical, but lately I've been thinking, is it radical? Is it radical? Should, it, should it be radical to think that like, I mean, I could get into a whole other conversation about the state of American capitalism and how it's kind of led into the idea that you mentioned about needing hustle culture, I even for a while was exploring side jobs despite mm-hmm. having a full-time job because I was mm-hmm. so terrified of getting laid off and not having steady income that I was like, I need to be making another income stream. But the reality was I didn't because I was comfortable with my one full-time job, but I had, I felt so worried about it. Yeah. And again, I think it kind of goes back to the conversations and kind of learning money and all that kind of stuff, the psychology of money um, when I was younger, kind of how my parents and others around me approached money and talked about money. And the f- the fact that I could feel so financially insecure, despite not being financially insecure, was such a privileged way to feel like yeah. I'm in a really good place. I'm very privileged to be in a good place. Why do I still have that fear that's leading me to think that I need to hustle more and do more. And again, I think that kind of goes back to, to setting boundaries around all that stuff. And you shouldn't, it shouldn't be a radical idea to be comfortable and not want more. And that was one of the things that I heard again, a lot growing up. And I still hear a lot from some people that I want more. And again, that's okay. If that's what you want and that's Mm -hmm. what you want to work toward ethically, we'll put that caveat in ethically. I'm looking at you, Bezos. Um, (laughs) uh, Then that's fine. But again, we need to stop thinking that it's one size fits all and stop looking down on people for being comfortable 
and to start appreciating those jobs more that will allow people to be comfortable like the person that you met. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> realistically, in America, y- you're not going to be able to afford rent without no. five roommates sharing a one bedroom apartment right. on a part time job at a cafe. Yeah. But that's an essential job. Yeah. And people love doing that work. Yeah. So why is it so undervalued? Yes. And this, this, I love this. I love this because you and I have had this conversation before about career development and, you know, the work that we've done with career pathing, the work that we've done around um, leadership development and sort of this mindset that if you, there's something shameful or wrong about backing off of a job or backing away from the next level up or the next promotion up. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I remember having coaching conversations with people that were like, I don't know what to do because my boss wants to promote me into leadership and I don't want to be a leader. And we would talk about like, is, is that out of fear of being a leader that maybe it is something you want to do? Or is it that you legitimately don't want to do that? And, and for some of them, like, I literally, I don't want to do it but they were so afraid of basically shutting off the fountain of like, I'm I'm never going to get other opportunities. They're going to try to get rid of me next time they can, because they don't see that I have drive. They don't see that I'm taking initiative to move to the next level. So this whole concept of like it being okay to not want to move up the ladder, um, this is a tough one. And this, it's really difficult, especially in the, in the type of work we do in, in HR and in career development. Um, But even if, if we have people listening right now that are like, I'm being pressured to, to take this next level job. It's okay to not want to take the next level job. It's okay. Yeah. Um, Don't, don't take it because you feel obligated to don't take it because you feel like you have to, and if the, the culture of the company that you're working in is telling you that you are going to lose out on future chances, future opportunities for lateral moves or maybe different projects or things that might come up that you might want to do in the future, then you really need to, to look at whether or not you want to be a part of that work culture at all. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think that's another one of those areas that companies are currently missing the mark on, just like with employee engagement, how it's kind of been twisted and become this thing is career development is now also being misinterpreted and twisted as always needing to move up and on to the next best thing. And that's not what it means. Career development should absolutely encompass people who want to stay in their current job or potentially move laterally, but at the same level or even down because they want to look at a completely different area because they're wanting to try new things. And I've also experienced, you know, I've had leaders in the past where I've told you this before that I made the mistake of joking about wanting to become the chief learning officer of a company. And Mm -hmm. I made it in just because I never know what to say when I have leaders who are like, where do you want to go next? Where do you, where do you see yourself in five years? I don't know. I don't know where I see myself next week. Retired. Like (laughs) I can't even, I don't even, I have to have my calendar open to see what I'm doing this weekend. So like, I don't know what I want to do in five years. Plus (laughs) with the rate that things change all the time, the answer is probably going to change. So why should I have to think that far ahead right now with my career? Yeah. And I was like, I just, I just want to focus on what I'm doing right now and grow in my current skills in my job yeah. and learn more about my current job mm-hmm. next year. That could be completely different. I could decide that I want to go into a completely different industry. I just don't know. And after I made that joke about like, I don't know, maybe I want to become the chief learning officer. That leader did not let that go. And every conversation we had after that, even when I tried to correct it and pull back, they was like, okay, let's figure out where we're going to get you there. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be the chief learning officer. That's not my dream. <laughs> Um, And that's, I think, again, kind of a broader conversation around Mm -hmm. even dating back to like when I was growing up, there was no question I was going to college, right? There were no other options. The only valued path or worthy path was to go through college and get a quote unquote worthwhile degree, which again, I could go off in a whole other tangent about that, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, I think it's also that everybody should be aspiring to move up the ladder because those are the jobs 
that are worthy that everybody wants, Mm -hmm. but they shouldn't be because there are only so many positions at the top, first of all. So only so many people can get there. But I think there's a fear at the top right now. And this is maybe me a little bit of a hot take. I'm sure there are people who disagree, but um, (laughs) it also might be a little bit of a conspiracy. But if we start to devalue those jobs and take them off of the pedestals they used to be on, they kind of lose their value and worthiness if that's the reason that they moved into those positions was to feel mm-hmm. superior to other people. Mm-hmm. And if all of a sudden we're like, I'm good and I, I don't envy your job, I'm going to stay where I am. How it takes some of the feel? cachet away from what yeah. they do. Yeah. yeah. How am I supposed I mean, to feel now? <laughs> yeah. Even this whole concept of having career plans. I mean, and mm-hmm. this is something that, you know, we, we literally teach this for a living. We, we literally teach this for a living. Yeah. I suck at career planning. Like I cannot do it. I cannot do it because I'm not a person who has any interest in planning my life five years out. I I like to go with the flow. I like to see where things are taking me and like, maybe we'll live here. Maybe we'll live here. Maybe I'll become a sheep herder. I don't know. I'm going to go with the opportunities that the universe is throwing at me and decide, do I like this? Am I interested in this? Maybe I'm interested in this other thing, you know? Um, I mean, a, a perfect example of this 10 years ago, if I had been planning out what I'm doing now, I would, I would not be, I would not be in Texas. Um, I would not be teaching belly dance because it just, it sort of fell in my lap and I'm like, oh, this is cool. This is fun. I'm going to try this for a little while and see what happens. And so, yeah, this sort of rigid structure to getting yourself where you're supposed to be at a certain point in your life is, is really difficult to wrap your brain around for some of us. Well, thanks for joining me. If you have suggestions, feedback, or just something random you want to share, email me at careerspeakeasy at gmail.com and come visit again soon. Cheers.